Uh, good evening. My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the curator and head of programs at the Power Plant. For the six year running, our Toronto has commissioned the Power Plant to develop a speaker program for the fair, and we're pleased to present this year's lineup. Over the next three days, we will be joined by three prominent international curators and directors who will present on their distinctive practices Trevor Smith, Ralph Rugoff, and Kitty Scott. Tonight, I would like to welcome, to, to welcome you to our first power talk by Trevor Smith entitled The Museum in the Present Tense. First, some quick thank yous. Many people have helped ensure the success of Power Talks. At Art Toronto, I'd like to acknowledge Lionel Rubinchuk and Susanna Rosenstock, among many others. Uh, the Power Plant is indebted to the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, and our partners at Harbourfront Centre. Our public programs are supported by primary education sponsor, CIBC Woodgundy. Uh, please note that the uh, Power Plant's current exhibitions are on view from 12 until 6 this weekend, um, and you can gain free access with your Art Toronto uh, pass. And the Power Plant is just a five-minute walk from here if you um, aren't aware. So now to Trevor Smith. Uh, Trevor was born in Regina and is the inaugural curator of contemporary art at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. And this is the oldest continually operating museum in the U.S. Previously, Smith was curator in residence at the Center for Curatorial Studies Bard College, where he co-curated Russell in 2006, the inaugural exhibition at the Hessel Museum of Art, and Martin Creed, Feelings, in 2007, which was the first large-scale uh, survey of the artist's work. From 2003 to 2006, Smith was curator at the New Museum in New York, where he um, co-curated the acclaimed exhibition of Andrea Zettel's um, Critical Space, and presented a major Brian Youngin survey that came from the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, most recently, he was a curator uh, of the 2011 Singapore Biennial, Open House, and Smith's talk will reflect on this recent work um, and developing a contemporary program for the Peabody Essex, which seeks to connect historical expression to contemporary experience and to amplify dialogue across cultures. So after the talk, Trevor will accept questions, um, but I'd ask you to please use the microphone as we're recording tonight's talks. And please welcome me in joining Trevor. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's really great to be here. <laughs> um, so as Melanie mentioned, um, my talk today is called The Museum in the Present Tense. And it's going to kind of spiral out, or it's, it's kind of a meditation on what, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do at the Peabody Essex Museum, which is, um, you know, as Melanie mentioned, it's one of the longest, it is the longest continuously operating museum in the United States. But I don't think many people in the contemporary art world have ever heard of it. Um, this is a photograph of it, um, the, well, the main campus anyway. Uh, the building in, in the foreground was designed by Moshe Safdie in 2003, and the earliest uh, building, uh, which is more or less invisible in this photograph, uh, was the East India Marine Hall, which was inaugurated in 1825 and is on the National Register. Um, the museum as a whole has something like 22 historic properties, many of them on the National Register. It has a collection of some, nobody knows exactly how many things are in the collection, like that's what happens when your collection is 200 years old. Um, the collection is somewhere around 800,000 objects, somewhere between 800,000 and a million photographs and then these historic properties, as well as a 200-year-old uh, Chinese merchant house. Um, the, one of the things about working in a place like this that really interests me is that, you know, I, I, I kind of I don't have to sell contemporary art, you know? Like, nobody cares. Nobody has, you know, like, that kind of historical specific background. Nobody cares about minimalism. Nobody cares about art forum and freeze and everything else. But it does have an extraordinary audience of what we call culturally inquisitive people. And it also seems to me that in, in the art world right now, we're kind of at a bit of a turning point where 
you know, our, our relationship to different historical modalities is, you know, being, being re-examined, being re-questioned. Artists are, you know, um, have reminded us that there was a history before 1968, for example. Um, and, and if you start looking, whether you're looking at the high end of, of the commercial market in spaces like Hauser and Wirth on Piccadilly, where they kind of occupy this, this, this very traditional bank building, or through to, um, you know, just, just the extraordinary number of shows that have been happening lately where contemporary art is, you know, slowly being reconnected with that kind of deep history uh, that predates um, what we all thought of as the modern, modernist ruptures, but in fact, um, it goes back much deeper. And this museum, as you will see, is, I think, really critically positioned to kind of tell some of that story. So I come into this museum with this incredible legacy, but, you know, it has work from around the world. You know, it has a 200-year relationship to Asia. Um, it has a global range of collections, but no modernism, no European painting. Um, so it's, it's, in a way, exactly the kind of opposite. Like, this is the museum of everything that all those modernist museums don't have. <laughs> it's sort of the other side of, of the coin. So this, for example, is my uh, Damien Hirst. You know, the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. Um, but, but I don't have to talk about the market. I don't have to talk about minimalism. I don't have to talk about speculation. And I don't have to talk about the, any of that. But I can, at the same time, meditate on this longer trajectory of which the Hearst is a part. Um, we can also think about the relationship between art and culture, because this is in fact a museum of art and culture. It's not just about art. It's not just art as a kind of a critique of culture, but it's very interested in um, thinking about art in culture. That's my Rodney Graham. It's one, one of a collection of some 7,000 unique Civil War envelopes um, that exists in, in the Phillips Library, which is one of our e extraordinary collections. The, um, so I was brought in in 2008 into this kind of amazing context. And this is a museum that since 2003, when they reopened with the Safety Wing, had kind of talked about the importance of linking historical expression to contemporary experience and linking across cultures. And, but they had no collection of contemporary art, really. You know, there's a, a they had attempted to and still do install contemporary pieces in with the historical material. But it felt like there needed to be something more, and there needed to be a kind of a reflection on who is it anyway that is going to be making these kind of connections between the past and the present? Who is it that kind of keeps, keeps culture living? And that, of course, is the artists. So I walk into the museum on my first day, and they take me for a walk around the campus, and they say, so... Would you like this room for contemporary art, or would you like that room for contemporary art? I said, I don't want a room. Because, <laughs> you know, if I have a room for contemporary art, then <clears throat> what you do is you effectively kind of create a shrine for those who love contemporary art in the room that everybody else kind of avoids. And making shows in these large institutions is difficult at the best of times, so really there has to be a kind of a bigger risk. There has to be a bigger play here. And so, what I proposed to them was that instead of giving me a room, 
what we would do is each time I wanted to work with an artist that we would declare a free trade zone. You know, this is a museum that was founded on, on uh, the history of trade, so you know, it's sort of a language that, that, that they understand. And the artists in this room and many of the historians in this room will be well aware that there's so many, artists have had so many fantastic ideas uh, to make projects, to work in, in these kinds of institutions, but, the, but there's, no, there's no mechanism by which they can get in there, you know, so that somebody will say, oh, well, you can't put that contemporary piece in that room because it's not 18th century, or you can't put that painting in that room because that's a room of textiles. You know, there's always these reasons, and there's always these frames, and there's always these boxes that, of course, we necessarily put things into. But, um, but it, it just felt like the museum, this museum in particular, but I think museums in general, need, they don't need a new curatorial model. But what they do need are some institutional tools by which the artists can be f facilitated to go on a journey so that we can see the museum through their eyes, so that we can evolve, too. So what we came up with was um, a program called Freeport. And the idea of Freeport, um, as I say, it's like the, the idea of these free trade zones, and I worked with um, Goto Design, um, who, who are fantastic designers in New York that I've worked with at, at Bard, and I worked with on the Singapore project to kind of come up with a logo, you know, so you're sort of branding, branding these projects inside the bigger matrix of, of the Peabody Essex Museum. You know, when, when when the museum relaunched, it sort of had an, a new logo, and, and the logo is kind of Bodoni, you know? Bodoni, it's a saffron red Bodoni, and P-E-M, and the M is a italic, and, and, and they kind of talk about it like leaning into the future, and I kind of think of this logo as reaching into the past, because you kind of need the movement in, in, in both directions. So, The way that this works is each time I work with an artist, I invite them in. We have a wander around the museum, the different buildings, the different spaces, the different collections, just to kind of see what will spark their interest. And of course, you know, I'm looking for um, people that I think will resonate with, with, uh, with the space. And what I'm showing you here is uh, an etching from 1867 of the East India Marine Hall, which was the original hall of, of the museum. It's kind of sacred territory in a way. This is, this is the hall today, but this is the hall where um, I realize I haven't told you the story about how the museum came to be, did I? So, you have this hall, and you'll, you'll notice that there are some casework by the, by the fireplace flues, and those, those caseworks are still in situ. So, the museum began life as the East India Marine Society. It was founded in 1799, basically, 13 years after the first ship from Salem hit, hit the port of Canton. And to be a member of this society, you had to have either have crossed Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn, and you had to bring back these objects that kind of spoke of your experiences. And the kind of objects that the founders brought back weren't so much antiquities, but they were kind of objects of wonder, objects of curiosity, tchotchkes, contemporary uh, objects. But they were objects that to me very much spoke about these experiences of economic trade, 
of um, cultural exchange, of the experience of translation, translation of language, of form, of ideas, uh, of techniques across cultures. And those, those objects were brought back and they sort of became, be, were the, in a way they were like mnemonic devices. They were, they were the occasion to tell stories. And the stories that they told of trade and exchange and translation really drove cultural change in America. I mean, in 1810, Salem was the wealthiest town in America. It's hard to believe now. It's, you know, kind of a quiet suburb just, just, just north of Boston. You know, as the ships got bigger, the harbor became too, um, kind of became unnavigable and um, the shipping trade just, just, just moved south. But in that time, what was happening in this hall with this collection was really important for Americans' understanding of their place in the world. And it really feels to me like those dynamics of trade and exchange and translation, I mean, they're still driving cultural change today. And so it feels like there's a very direct line between the history of, of this museum that in many ways sort of made the opposite bet to institutions like MoMA uh, and so forth that were founded around you know, late 20s, early 30s who kind of made their bet on modernity of you know, the future of utopias of change. This institution sort of made its bet on tradition and the rest of it. But now that we're kind of in somewhere in the 21st century, we begin to see how how these things are locking together. So this, this was the first project that we did. Um, this is the same room that was in the previous slide. It's uh, the work of an artist called Charles Sanderson who, who creates these sort of animated digital text projections often on public architectural sites. Uh, he's done things on the facade of the Grand Palais in, in Paris, for example. And, you know, Charles came in and he had to wander around and, of course, he walks into that hall and goes, oh my God, this, this hall's amazing and this, this is where I want to work. Can, can I do it? And, of course, to me, that's the first place you want to do something because the idea of this program is not, you know, to kind of add a kind of a contemporary thing over on the side somewhere, a kind of a marginal activity in, inside of um, a traditional institution, but rather to embed contemporary thought and contemporary thinking right at the heart of the museum. So Charles picked up on this idea that these, um, that the objects that are on display in this room to this day are the only thing tying them together really are these trade routes. You know, um, you know, they come from all over the world, but it's that idea of the kind of journeys. And so I happened to mention to him because he knows, um, I know that he's always looking for that kind of textual riff, said, well, we have these extraordinary ship's logs just across the street in the Phillips Library. We have one of the great collections of ship's logs. And so we went over there and, you know, you're sort of back of house looking, looking through these extraordinary books that for the most part only, um, you know, only researchers are looking at. Um, and just, just incredible images and, um, and Charles, this is actually the first time where um, his, his experience with his handwriting sort of shifted the work because before this point, what he did was made, made work where the text was filtered through, you know, um, the font that's embedded down in, in the operating system of, of your computer. Uh, and here, instead, what he's done is, is he's working off of actual scans of, the, um, of these logs. And so, you know, there's pixels, pixel streams. Uh, he picks out objects with light. He's 
um, you know, it goes from pixels to words to, you know, whole images, whole, whole page views, and then at a certain point, the thing just kind of collapses and begins again. Um, this is a sort of a time-lapse image that gives you a little bit more of a sense of that kind of flow. And one of the things that I've always been um, interested in is trying to make projects where historical material or history isn't just a prop for the contemporary, but rather there's some back and forth. There's a kind of a opening up of um, the possibility to kind of un understand these things as part of the same breath or the same sentence. And because Charles had picked up so, so strongly on these logs, I was able to propose that the maritime curator could make a show of the books themselves, that without this show, they never would have you know, pulled them out. And so, so the program isn't just about like my program, it's not just about contemporary art, but it's really about activating those, those, those spaces between things and the opportunity to understand these different proximities. And this is, this is an image from what they call a commonplace book. Um, it's the Tiffin book. It's this incredible, um, the commonplace books aren't so much, you know, the sort of daily logs, but they're more personal reflections. They often have ditties and drawings and, you know, they're sort of, um, you know, kind of personal narratives of the experiences that uh, the sailors and merchants were having. So one of the things about Freeport, of course each of these projects has to stand on their own and you can, you can get a sense to do a piece like that Sanderson in what is in a way sacred territory for the museum, right in the heart of this like national, um, you know, na national register, neoclassical hall. I mean, it represents everything that um, the museum comes from. And to actually have the museum be open to doing something like that where for six months, you know, people, People come from around the country to visit this hall because it's such, such a special place. And, you know, to, for them to have been willing to kind of go on that adventure is really, you know, a big part of the story here. Because curators all the time, we come up with these crazy ideas, right? It's like, oh, yeah, we could do this or we could do that. But unless you have the whole institution understanding what, what the goal of all that is, it, it just doesn't happen. So um, one of the things that I wanted the Freeport to do for the museum, I spoke about it earlier as a, as a kind of a tool for the museum to use, was that while, while each of these projects has to stand on its own two feet and it has to be its own thing. There's also a sense that, you know, you do Freeport number one, you do Freeport number two, and by the time you get to, well, now we're up to four and we have five and six coming up and all of a sudden it starts to smell more like a commitment. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, they're serious. It wasn't just a flash in the pan. It wasn't a one-off. Um, and the other thing that it, it, um, it can do is that be, because these projects run over a long period of time and these large institutions have a lot of different projects going at any one time, that one can kind of devise these loose thematic conversations. So you might do two or three free ports in, in, in a year that kind of activate a conversation about a topic of interest. And it's not like the art has to illustrate it, but um, there's a real problem in museums where you have so many different programs going and every, everybody wants their public program, everybody wants their lectures, everybody wants their 
um, you know, their panel discussions and their openings and so forth. But there just aren't the resources. So somebody or some projects, I think, need to be devised that help museums connect the dots between, cult between projects or um, allow you to have a kind of a conversational arc that takes place over more than that 10-week period that a show is off and on for. You know, because, oh, so this week we're talking about China, and next week we're talking about the Maya, and then the week after that, it's something else. And of course, it's great to talk about those things, and it's one of the things I really love about working at a museum like this, that, you know, that, 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 that framework is so large and so malleable, and there's so many threads to it that contemporary art, in a way, can kind of provide these vectors of, of conversation and communications. You're not always like starting, starting from, from, from scratch. So the third Freeport um, was in the same room. And it's a new commission from Susan Phillips. It's a piece called If I With You Would Go. So after six months of the Sanderson, you know, where we closed off the light in this incredible room and kind of projected these, these words, all of a sudden the light comes back into the room, but you still have the projected words, but instead of vision, it's sound. I don't know how many of you know Susan, Susan's work, but she's made extraordinary installations um, around the world where, where she sings songs in sort of specific architectural situations. And often, you know, the architecture, there's something about the site that impels um, her choice of song, and then the choice of song then, then begins to resonate. She won the Turner Prize last year in England for a piece called Lowlands, which was a, th a three-channel piece. So one of the things that starts to happen when artists come and they start to kind of pick up on something is that Susan's Susan called me about six weeks before the show opened, okay? And I knew she wanted the room. I knew she wanted to do an eight-channel piece because she hadn't been able to do an eight-channel piece before, and, you know, she wanted to try that. So I said, great. So she calls, calls me up about six weeks before the show's to open, and she says, Trevor, I finally have it. Okay. What I want to do is I want to sing one of the child ballads. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> What's a child ballad? And down, down the rabbit hole I go. And turns out that a child ballad um, is a term given to a collection of ballads, of English and Scottish ballads that was collected by this um, character called Francis James Child who was, in fact, the son of a Boston sailmaker, so it had this kind of local resonance for Susan. And what, what he did in, in the middle to the late of the 19th century was, you know, sort of to try to take the, undertake this impossible task of um, collecting the last remnants of the oral history, you know, of the great ballad tradition. And to that end, he would kind of collect as many different ballads as he could, as many different versions of the ballads as he, that he could, and he published it in, in this huge compendium that then became the kind, of, um, um, the kind of basis for a lot of the folk song revivals in, in, in the 20th century. So like when Joan Baez was recording many of these songs and that generation in, in uh, the early 60s, they would make these little acknowledgements on the album. It would say like, you know, Child, Child Ballad 238 or Child Ballad 243. 
So the ballad that Susan, Susan chose, chose to sing um, was a song called The Demon Lover, which is more commonly known in America as The House Carpenter. And, you know, Baez did it, and Dylan did it, and Natalie Merchant did it, and it's a really, really well, well-known song. But it tells the story of a young woman whose lover went to sea, and the lover never comes home, and life goes on, you know. Um, and she starts up a family with, with the house carpenter. And one night the lover returns, and he tempts her away with these tales of adventure and wealth, and you know, seeing seeing new new places. And so she steals away with, with, with her lover and sails away. And a few weeks at sea, she starts to miss her family. And she looks down and she spies her lover's foot and realizes he has a cloven hoof. <laughs> and of course her lover isn't her lover at all. He's a devil and he scuttles the ship and sends her to, sends them to hell. It's one of those, you know, beautiful, up, uplifting, moral, moral tales from the 19th century. And so there were eight different versions of, of, of this song that were recorded, that were collected by child. And so there's eight speakers through the room. And because the different version, it, the eight speakers begin in unison, and then one by one, the voices drop away until you're left with a single voice. Because, of course, the different lengths of the versions, and it's just like this incredibly lonely, haunting um, sound. And, and then she also recorded a, um, a kind of a interlude on violin and wine glass kind of evoking this, this, empty, this empty ship. So I started doing a little digging. And, you know, when we talk about kind of the museum in, in, in the present tense, we're kind of talking about cultural wetware. We're talking about, you know, the idea that kind of a, a decision made one day might, you know, come back in very unexpected ways in 50 years, 100 years, 150 years. So I, I started doing some research on Francis Child. And, you know, as a son of a sailmaker, he didn't have a lot of money. But his education was provided for. Um, there's actually kind of a tradition of that sort of thing in Boston for children of, you know, high, that they felt had, had, had high um, hopes or capacities for learning. And in 1848, he finished his um, dissertation. And a guy called J. Um, Ingersoll Bowditch provided funds for um, the young child to go to Germany and study with, among others, the Grimm brothers. And of course, the Grimm brothers fairy tales was a similar kind of project in terms of that oral history of, of uh, the day. And that example, you know, of meeting, of the Grimm Brothers projects and meeting them was, was to be a profound influence on Child's life. And to the day he died, he had a portrait of the Grimm Brothers over his, his uh, fireplace, or not his fireplace, his, his desk. And so the person that funded this trip was a member of the society, the East, the East India Marine Society. And his father was one of the founding members, and that's Nathaniel Bowditch here on the left. Many of you may not know the name Nathaniel Bowditch, but any of you who sail probably do, because that book that sailors carry with them with all the kind of practical navigation instructions, that's him. <laughs> He sort of synthesized a lot of that knowledge at the, at, at the early part of the 19th 
century and as a result saved, saved a lot of lives. And to this day, mariners call this book the Bowditch. So, you know, this, all these kind of connections of you know, life and death and seafaring and and of course, this, in, this investment in this young man that was made in 1848 to go off to Germany and collecting these, these, these tales that end, then end up being you know, kind of recorded by Harry Smith in, the Ap in Appalachia <laughs> in the middle of the 20th century. And, and then of course, in 2011, it becomes this Susan Phillips installation as part of a contemporary program. And it's all just so intertwined that, um, you know, to kind of talk about tradition and contemporary and modernity and past and present, it, it, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to drive hard and fast um, divisions between them. So Freeport, as I mentioned, you know, kind of moves around the building. And the other thing that I see it as being is that, well, I might have, in a way, established the program or I run the program. I'm, I don't always have to be the curator of the program. I mean, it has to be the museum's program. So uh, Philip Proger, who is uh, our photo curator, proposed to work with Mar Marianne Mueller, who's a photographer from Switzerland. And Marianne has this kind of amazing and quite obsessive archival practice where kind of every single image she's ever taken, whether or not it, she thought it sucked at the time, like no, nothing, nothing gets thrown out, it gets filed and categorized and numbered. And Philip kind of made this proposition that, well, I'll tell you what, I'll curate your archive and you come in and you look at our archive because we have like 800,000 some photographic images, most of which are before 1920, many of which are um, connected to Asia, either by Asian photographers or people traveling there. And it ended up as this, as this kind of much larger project where it was her photographs and our photographs and, and the um, American Decorative Arts Collection, the Peabody Essex has a very renowned collection of that kind of material as well. And very, whereas the museum often, you know, the kind of ideologies of display seem to interest artists a lot. You know, when they come in and they kind of see how the kind of choices we make in terms of how we're displaying objects and the way that, you know, we have this habit of cleaning objects up and making them kind of perfect and beautiful and they're pristine examples, but what, but what was so interesting to her was, you know, the kind of object as something to be used, something that had a life, something that bore, bore the traces. And so she went in there into the archives and it was a real challenge for the museum um, in that, you know, she's, she's looking at these objects for particular reasons and the conservators are looking at the objects for another kind of reason and the curator's looking at the objects for yet another kind of reason. And, you know, to work with artists like that, it kind of brings some of those tensions forward and provides a kind of a interesting context to um, speak about them. And the other thing that she did was she would kind of wander around Salem at night. Like, she actually spent a couple months with us. And um, it, it's almost like the piece became a kind of a self-portrait of the artist as in the time that she lived in. Salem, and you could see her both picturing, you know, the kind of grand federal style architecture as well as the kind of the homely, the barely repaired, the kind of falling apart at the seams it is the, you know, your typical kind of post-industrial American small town. Freeport number four um, is a filmmaker called Peter Hutton. I first heard of Peter Hutton through 
my friend Sis Birnings, who was a who was a great film curator in Europe. And when he heard I was go, going to Bard, he says, "Oh, you have to meet Peter. He's an amazing guy. He's an amazing guy." I'm going, Peter, who, what? <laughs> you know, because he's he's a guy who has this amazing reputation in 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 the film world, but has had almost no reputation in in the gallery world. And in 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 the year before we showed showed this work, which is on right now, um, his film At Sea, which I'm showing you here, was named uh, the top, or the number one avant-garde film of the last decade by a jury of his peers in Film Comment. And another one of his films was uh, named to the National Film Register. And a figure like that that kind of crosses over these different realities is 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 of real interest to me so peter um, peter made this extraordinary film called at sea which is sort of the life and death of a, of a container ship uh, the film opens in in the shipyards in korea and you go on a journey across the sea and you end up in bangladesh watching you know the, the ships that you saw being these high, this highly engineered construction devolving into almost like a kind of a Stone Age manual tearing apart. Um, Edward Bertinsky, of course, has also done a lot of um, images of, of, this, um, of this subject. And there's also a new film out that I hear is very good, but I haven't had the opportunity to see it. For those of you who are interested, a film called um, Iron Crows, which actually kind of follows the the life of um, some of these people do, doing this 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 work. Now, the Peabody Essex has one of the great maritime collections in the country, but of course, it's a collection that you know is by and large 18th, 19th century material. Um, and of course, in the 18th, 19th, early 20th century, ships were self-evidently how we move things around the world. And I think today we don't think so much about, about, this, about this aspect of marine culture, marine life. And it's also kind of an opportunity to not only put something contemporary in dialogue with historical material, but maybe kind of bring back some of those questions and some of that original context that that original material would have thrown up, you know, questions about, you know, mercantilism, questions of trade. Um, and the ship you see in the foreground is an 1810 model of um, a late 18th century ship called the Friendship, which was the kind of ship that would have been used by the by the traders in Salem when they were traveling to to um, Canton, and interestingly enough, this this model was very important in the National Maritime Service recreating this vessel, and so today, like. If I go down a certain street on on the way home, I have that kind of surreal experience of passing like a a three master just half a dozen blocks from my house. But if I look out in the other way, I see like the national grid gas tank so and you can see in 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 the back how how we're screening the film so it's kind of op a bit more op open to the room there's a kind of a dialogue as as you go past so one of the things i i when i set out to make freeport i kind of wanted to make something that was formless you know that could be anything it could be inside the museum it could be outside the museum it could be in the collection it could have its own room it could be public space it could be private space it could be any length of time, but all of these projects, in some ways, it turns out I'm ending up commissioning something. The museum is end up having that kind of commitment to an artist to realize a new work, a new project, and, you know, so the Sanderson one, one, one was 
a commission that was based on the hall. The Susan Phillips, again, was based on the hall. The Marianne Mueller was a new project. And when I asked Peter, well, you know, I think this film is amazing and I, I can just show the film, that'll work, not a problem, we can just do it low-key, but is there something else that you would like to do? And he said to me, you know, one of the things that's really important to me in my work is, you know, that question of kind of scale and the fascination, you know, um, uh, when you look at the, when you see his films, you, you see that kind of body, um, in, you know, the scale of those bodies in relation to the scale of the ship. And, and he, he was very interested in the kind of reverse relationship of that that you have when you're looking at a ship's model. And we have this fantastic collection of models. And as we started talking, you know, we realized, you know, that there's like ship's models to help in construction, but you never memorialize the ship breaking. You know, you have the presentation model, you know, when the ship is being launched, but you, you never see the death mask of a ship. And so what we ended up doing was working with a very traditional model maker to create what I believe to be, if not the first, one of the very first models or represent, representations made in this very traditional medium of, you know, this, this, this very contemporary um, and very dangerous activity of ship breaking. And, you know, it, it, so people coming in, looking, looking for the, looking at the ship's models, and they come across this, this thing, and it's sort of like, what's, what's going on? So, so the next project, um, and I'll kind of wrap it up, um, after this, and we'll open it to to some 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 questions. Looks at a very a very different area of the collection, um, which is this extraordinary collection of what what is called Asian export art. So it's like all those objects and materials, uh, you know, the porcelains, the um, the silver, the furniture that was made in Asia for export to the Middle East, to Europe, and America. And the Peabody Essex has a kind of preeminent collection of that, 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 that kind of material. And what I'm, what I'm showing you here is uh, a figure called Mr. Nobody, which is, you know, it's about 10 inches tall, 24 s centimeters. And it's reputedly the first representation of a European in Jing De Zhen porcelain. It's a piece dating to about 1690. And it's one of the kind of leaping off points for Michael Lin, uh, who, who is an artist who's better known for these kind of large scale, uh, architectural scale paintings of decorative motifs. He's also doing, doing some paintings with us, but I wanted to to just kind of talk a little bit about this, about this figure. So what you have on the left there is, as I say, the, the 1690 piece from Jing De Zhen in China. On the right, you have a tourist, uh, or sorry, um, kind of a commercialized knockoff of Delft porcelain piece in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg, but that's kind of like the gift shop version. And in the middle, you have the original frontispiece from the play Nobody and Somebody, from which the figure of Mr. Nobody is drawn. And so one of the things we're doing with Michael is we're going to produce a huge multiple of Mr. Nobody. 
And when I think about this museum with these, with these collections that, you know, by <clears throat> any standards of the contemporary art world are kind of obscure backwaters, you know, like there's not anybody that I know of in the contemporary art world going, hey, let's, let's talk about Asian export art. But if I think about this museum and that has that incredible maritime history, which the maritime history, of course, is a global history, but for the most part, the story that we tell is about Americans going out to the world and this experience of trade and the sort of anti-colonial, um, you know, the Revolutionary Wars and the rest of it. And then, and, and then you have this collection of Asian export material, which in some ways is Asia answering back. You know, it's like the figure on the left kind of, you know, the, the way they've kind of freestyled those, those, those marks. It looks kind of like a, a kid with a biro doing SpongeBob or something. And then, then you have American decorative arts, which again is, uh, you know, because we say it's American decorative arts, you think automatically American, but then you start looking at it and you realize it's an amalgam of, of those other stories. And so this, this, this kind of Ouroboros that the museum traces really from 17th, 18th century forward, these dynamics of trade and exchange and translation that drove cultural change trying to find ways to kind of talk about those dynamics today as a kind of a way to connect the legacy of, of this museum both to, I think, what a lot of concerns of contemporary artists are, but also what the kind of concerns of the people who come, who come through the door. Because, you know, I'm not really interested in selling contemporary art, as I sort of said at, 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 at the beginning of the talk. But, I am interested in artists and I am interested in culture and I'm interested in museums as, as a kind of a space, as almost like a kind of a vanishing civic, the possibility of that vanished civic space where one can once again kind of stand and consider and think about and maybe renew our sense of our, our connectedness and our distance from and our proximity to other cultures, other times, other places in the world. And so I think I'll leave it there, but thank you for listening to my stories, my tales, <laughs> and perhaps some of you may have questions, observations. Landon. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much, Trevor, really interesting. And I was just thinking about the difference between the Francis Elise project that was shown at Basel this year in the, is it the Schulich House? The, the old yeah. merchant house mm -hmm. of 17th yeah. century merchant house. And the difference being that he collected what 140 or 1400 or whatever, mm -hmm. those little images of the, the icon, the women, they're all faces, Catholic faces, right? Mm -hmm. or so the difference is that he, he was doing that for a long time, and then he found a museum or a, a merchant house, mm -hmm. and as a contemporary artist, brought his work to, to intervene, and it's an incredible intervention, what he does in that yeah. space. And what you're presenting is a little bit different, where you're inviting artists to come in and kind of, you know, here's a budget, and here's a museum, and mm -hmm. you're brilliant. I mean, Charles Sanderson's brilliant, and everything he's done is fabulous, so you're gonna win, right? Mm -hmm. So can you just talk a little bit about that difference? Like, are you actually, in a way, you're like the conceptual artist, saying, mm -hmm. I want, you're my material, Charles Sanderson, brilliant artist, and here's my site, <laughs> and I'm bringing you together to create this thing, compared to the Francis Elise, which is the artist generating the work and looking for that match. Maybe this is coming down the road in your curatorial yeah. project, too. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, just, just, just to speak a little bit about that Francis Elise project, um, it certainly was an ongoing project that Francis had had, and you know, he'd installed it in a number of other, other places. And so, in a way, the idea of 
putting it in in that particular house, I think was probably an institutional gesture. It was a pro proposal that would have gone to him. You know, I have this, I'm not, I'm not super interested in drawing clear lines between what I do, what an artist does, what a viewer does, what an institution does, as, as I am very interested in how do you make those, the tensions or the, you know, the, the different vectors that come into play resonate in a kind of a productive and meaningful sense. So, you know, whether I'm working with an artist or whether I'm working with a fellow curator, I kind of have this principle where anybody's allowed to kind of throw an idea on the table and that idea can, you know, it will either grow into something or it'll fall off on its own accord. And if I, pro if I suggest something to an artist, from the moment that they say, hey, that's a good idea, I might use that, it's their idea. Um, because we all have some of our best ideas when we sit around getting drunk at dinner and we're just talking and, you know, kind of wild propositions start flowing and something sticks. You know, this is, this is why, you know, thinking about not just things but the people who make the things and kind of creating an environment where th that kind of interface is foregrounded um, I think is like really critical. I mean one of the things that most people I think come to museums uh, and, and, and they see a work of contemporary art and they go like why they do that? And it's not necessarily a negative question, it's curiosity, you know, like, why'd they do that? And interestingly enough, I kind of feel like museums like this and some of these more kind of strange traditional institutions can actually kind of provide a context where some of, some of those force fields and some of that impetus is much, um, it's much more readily perceived. You know, I love the white cube. God knows I love the white cube. But, you know, you put something in, 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 in a white cube and it's sort of, you know, it's on its own. And of course, you're supposed to reflect on it and certain things happen and certain things are possible in that space. And other things I think are possible in this, mm -hmm. in this kind of space. But I absolutely think that, you know, my, my job is kind of to facilitate, to, to try to open up some channels, to kind of throw out some observations, you know, like I'm throwing out things here today that I'm kind of thinking about and I'm looking at how you're reacting, you know. That's the way I evolve, that's the way my practice evolves. So in that sense, like I'm not coming at this as an art historian, I'm not coming at this as, you know, um, um, an administrator, although, you know, I have to have a relationship to both those <laughs> disciplines or I can't get anything done, but, um, That's lovely. You know, yeah. Um, I wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you for the, uh, for the presentation. I'm, um, I'm perhaps a, a little naive, or perhaps I'm overly naive, I don't know. But it, when, when you first started to speak, I had the image of a, a two or three century old museum that was rather fixed in a period of time that you somehow found yourself joining. And that Somewhere you took it upon yourself to create a mission to give the museum a, a new relevance. It has a historical relevance, obviously, mm -hmm. but a new relevance to perhaps a, a newer audience. And that the creation of the Freeport projects might have just done that. It seems 
from what I've heard that you present history in a new, much more perhaps enjoyable light. Yet at the same time, you're not interested in definitions. You don't want to call yourself an artist. You're not interested in necessarily conceptual ideas. So, do you, do you perhaps consider that what you're doing is, apart from bridging time, which is extremely important, taking a museum and giving it the face of a gallery? Is that perhaps? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I kind of I kind of like like to kind of think of what I'm doing is <clears throat> allowing our visitors to see the museum through an artist's eyes. You know, I mean, you always um, histor uh, historical knowledge is important and curatorial knowledge is important, and you know, there's a reason why there's a room for Chinese art, you know, there's a reason why there's a room for Indian art, you know, there's, there's, there's certain knowledges that are embedded there that part of, you know, the principle of Freeport was kind of honoring that, you know, was to say, like, that's great and that's important, but we also need a way to understand what this dynamic space is between them, and I think that artists are the people that open up that dynamic space. Um, and, you know, it is true that I went to Salem, and it's this, you know, it's, that place has been around there. The museum's been around since 1799, but I, I cannot take credit for, um, you know, their their interest in and their kind of capacity to have these dialogues, because that, because that seed has was sown long before I arrived. I mean, I was brought in in a way to kind of make sense of, you know, their their com their interest in contemporary art or their interest more broadly in the culture of the present tense, and in a way, Freeport is sort of like the first move, the first ambit, the first tool, but the director is a guy called Dan, Dan Monroe, who's quite an extraordinary character. Uh, he's currently the president of the uh, American Association of Museum Directors, but he, he was not at all interested in, in this museum being about history in the sense of being cast in amber. You know, he was interested in, you know, this dynamic relationship. The idea that when you come to a museum, you're not just entering a kind of a storehouse of culture, but you're connecting, um, you're in a way staging and potentially transformative encounters. You know, that somebody who comes to a museum or comes to a gallery and stands in front of a work of art, there's a hope, there's a possibility that one might be moved by it, learn something from it, have one's perspective shifted a little bit, or have the time bomb go off six months, 12 months, 18 months, 20, whatever. Um, so that's kind of the starting point for this museum, and I think it's a really radical and open position, and I don't, um, I don't so often like to use that word radical, because it's just so, over, overused and badly used, but you know, to I th I think today and for a long time we've had this idea that tra traditional institutions are over here, and you know, you're either for modernity or you're against it. <laughs> you know, the the whole kind of global, the whole history of global trade that. This museum sort of has this incredible body of work to enable us to kind of untrace that back. You know, it sort of doesn't have modernism, but it sort of has everything that turned modernism on. You know, it's kind of uh, a, a fascinating potential. I think you found a, a fascinating way of dusting off the collection. You know, every 
every work of art ha has that kind of potential to come alive. I, uh, I'm sure all of us in, in this room have kind of stood in the middle of an exhibition and you're standing in front of like what you think is a great work but like it just looks like hell or like it's, it's just not speaking in that kind of context and you know as a curator I sometimes joke that I'm like the I'm like the paramedic of the art world, you know? It's like, damn it, that thing was alive when it left the studio. <laughs> and my job is to kind of keep it alive in this, in this strange new ecosystem of, of, of the museum. And that sort of, you know, goes for whether it's something brand new or something like that. Mr. Nobody, which was a figure that I spotted like the very first time I walked through the museum and go, wow, check that out, that is amazing. That is like, you know, 17th century SpongeBob. And, and yet, whenever I would talk to many of my colleagues and they go, I go, oh, you know that fantastic figure is like this? And, and I go, huh, what? So sometimes these projects just kind of allow you to just pull focus on something, you know, to kind of shift, shift the temporal register because you know, that's kind of what you're doing when you're organizing objects in space is you're organizing, you know, kind of, or creating a constellation through which a body moves and attention is caught in, in, in particular ways. And I think that so often with, um, I see so many shows that are so bad at that, you know, where it's kind of like you feel like you're you're, you're walking through somebody's shopping expeditions and it's boring. <laughs> um, I remember this experience once, I'll sh share this because Michael Snow is here. Uh, I was in Australia in the mid 90s and I sat in um, and there was a retrospective of Michael's films and at like two o'clock in the afternoon and you know some beautiful 30 degree day, blue sky, palm trees outside. And I dragged myself down to the basement of the art gallery to watch La Région Centrale. And like three hours later, like I walk up into the rest of the art gallery. It's like I had my, you know, third eyeball squeegeed or something. It was just like, I'm, and I'm looking at this stuff and I'm going, God, this is so bad. Because <laughs> like it just totally changed my tempo, my way of looking, my speed. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You know, so like, I live for those kinds of experiences as a viewer, as a curator. Uh, I, think, I think we all do. You know, it's like we want to be moved by something. You know, we want to feel something. Um, there's a kind of an emotional intelligence that we want to activate, but is, is so rarely activated. Um. Uh, I wondered about the residue of your uh, ex exhibitions, mm -hmm. and I wondered if the uh, ship wrecking model is now part of the collection of the museum. Indeed, it is. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't see the, the uh, collection as being a fixed? No, um, you know, element. I want to collect, you know, because I do think that. You know, people, when they founded that museum, brought objects in that spoke about their experiences of their culture and, and their time, and the kind of things that I'm bringing in, I want to speak about our culture and our time, or our cultures and our times. And the wonderful thing about that, one of the wonderful outcomes of the Sanderson project was, you know, we opened, opened, and like people walked into that hall and their jaws just dropped. And basically, by the end of the night, I mean, we hadn't worked out the details, but people had agreed to buy it for us. I'm like, hey, <laughs> that's fantastic. You know, just because this, I'm not preaching to the converted there. You know, it's, it's kind of like I'm talking to very intelligent people who have their own bodies of knowledge and their own experiences and often very deep 
associations with, with that museum. And to me, it was absolutely uninteresting to kind of come in and try to, you know, say, oh, you should like contemporary art. You know, like, why should they like contemporary art? I don't like contemporary art half the time, you know? <laughs> half the time it sucks. But, but, that's, but that's not a percentage that's any different than any other undertaking or discipline. I'm not being, I mean, I'm being a little provocative. But <laughs> um, so that was kind of part of what led me to, you know, kind of develop this language around Freeport, you know, because they understand the origins of the museum in trade. They, un they feel that there's a significance to that history in, in their lives today. And I can see analogies between what's going on there and what contemporary artists are doing. And so it's really just about act activating and refocusing something that they're already passionate about. Well, there we go with, yeah. shall we end on that passionate note? <laughs>